Hello, everybody. It's Keith. Help support the Northeast scene and declare yourself a member today. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast medium of choice. Rate us and leave a review. Every little bit helps. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It has every podcast episode plus other exclusive content. Like and leave a comment. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the NE Scene. Also, continue to write us at northeastscene at gmail.com. We want to share your experiences as well. And now, here's the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Northeast Scene Podcast. This is Keith. And Tommy. It's Monday night, and we're back to deliver the goods. How you doing? Not bad. I'm actually doing really well. I had a really super relaxing weekend. It was really fun. Spent a lot of time with the girls. Uh, did some sidewalk chalk. Hung out. Ooh. Yeah. I did it. Any tagging? No. I did a big Super Mario picture. How does it look? Uh, I put it on my Instagram. You can see. I'll, I'll send you the picture in a, when we're done. Oh, I posted this yesterday. We did sidewalk chalk and then Essie trying to walk in the driveway and then her playing in her, her uh, car. So I, w- I want to see that. Yeah. I'm interested in Super Mario. It's uh, I, you know what I found? And we do this a lot now. Uh, we'll like rinse the driveway down if we've done a lot of chalk and then we'll just kind of have like a clean slate to work with. There's a YouTube channel called, I think it's called easy to draw or fun to draw. And it's like three to four minute videos and they have all different kinds of characters on there. So like we did one last week of how to draw a scarecrow and then we did how to draw a haunted house. And then we did, and then we, so we, the whole driveway was just like all these different decorations. And the thing is, is we just put it on the iPad and we all just grab a piece of chalk and kind of spread out on the driveway and we all just watch it. Parenting sounds like every day you have to plan a podcast. <laughs> uh, you don't have to plan something every day, but you better have something in your pocket that if sh- things go to shit, like you have some type of thing to fall back on. Yeah. Because idle time with young children is a is v- it's very slow going time because they just constantly are in trouble. Yeah, I remember my older sister was like, oh, my kids are never going to watch TV. I was raised on TV. We're not going to do that within the first year or two the tv was there because (laughs) you just need something anything for a break no for like a five minute break no you're absolutely right it's really hard is uh so they have ipads that they have to use for school because they're still in online school right um but they have uh the the thing on the settings now that you can just set it up so they can have screen time that's not educational so they get an hour every day of non-educational screen time i love that the, and they found a really cool way around it. And I was very, I was very proud of them for this. They realized that if they watch each other do the screen time, they basically get two hours. So they'll go on YouTube, a kid's YouTube, and they'll watch all these videos. And then when they watch them, they sit together and put the iPad in between their laps and share it. That's great. So they get two hours a day. I was in Sleepy Hollow, which is a great place to be this time of year. Because I went up there to visit a friend with Romy. Wait, it's a real place? Yeah, in New York. It's a town. Like, is it... I I hate to ask this. Is it like the whole thing is like that... The story was based in that place? Like, this sounds so dumb. Like, it... it, it, (laughs) (laughs) Is it a place where the guy who wrote the story is from? Is that... That's what I'm asking. I think so. And they just renamed it. So. They renamed the town because they were like, oh, I remember that guy wrote that story about fucking Nick. No, I think the guy is from that town and there's some history in that town. It okay. was a Russian warrior and he lost his head and then he's riding around looking for his head. I, I got to look more into the history uh, one day when I have more time. <laughs> but the town is real. We were there and I thought we were just going to kind of like take a leisurely stroll through the woods real quick it ended up being a a grueling three plus mile hike oh really and it was fucking 
yeah, it w- it was exhausting, but it was awesome. I mean, we saw hawks and vultures and cool trees and amazing views. And my friend does these seasonal murals under the bridge, and we got to see that. And it was just awesome. It was great, uh, great fall adventures. Plus, I don't get out as much as I would like to, so it was nice to get out and walk around and be physical. And it was a good time. How far? How far is it from the city? It was quick. Oh, really? The express train, it's two stops from Grand Central. So it was good, but I, I have a question for you. Yeah, what do you got? All right. Let's say, all right, you're 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 married. You have three kids, right? Uh-huh. All right. Let's say one day you come home and you say to your wife, I can't do my job anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then you, you decide you're going to just go to the ocean every day for a year and film. All right, you with me so far? Yeah. And then you you become friends with an octopus. And every day you come home and tell your wife about the octopus. I'm friends with the octopus. I love the octopus. Every day for a year, what would your wife do? Uh... I don't, I don't know. That's pretty outlandish shit. Uh, she would finally get fed up and say, "Shut the fuck up about the octopus." <laughs> she does. She would have. She would do that on day three. She has no tolerance for people's horseshit. But anyway, my point in in presenting this scenario is: there's a new documentary film on Netflix called "My Octopus Teacher," and you know we got we got back from the we got back from Sleepy Hollow. It, I got into bed at 8 p.m. and I was like, "I'm dead. I'm done. Yeah. Like, I, I got. I'm just not getting back up." And I didn't. So we watched this movie, and this this is what the guy does. He's a he, he's a film guy. He's filming things, and he decides, you know, I can't film anymore. I don't want to edit anymore. I don't want to see an editing room. He loves the ocean. He grew up near the ocean, so he just goes into the ocean every day for a year, and b- he meets this octopus, and he's friends with the octopus. And the octopus is crawling on him, and every day he swims down and finds the octopus. And I kept making jokes the whole time. Romy's like, "Boy, you're on fire! Like you're never this creative." <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm like, who is this guy's wife? Like, what is he? What is he doing?" If I came home, or if I if I was with you, right, Romy, and I'm and every day I'm leaving, and I'm like, "All right, I'm going to go see the octopus," you would think I was having an affair, oh, or yeah, yeah. that I was breaking mentally, or something was going on. Yeah. And this guy can quit his job and go see the octopus every day for a year. Uh, is he like independently wealthy? Like they- that was my question. I was researching. I I was trying to figure out if he was independently wealthy. I know he's divorced. I was trying to figure out if the divorce that's happened. Su- that's not a surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to know if the divorce happened during the filming of the documentary. Uh, there. I have many questions. Many questions. The yeah. guy. He has a kid. You know, all of his fr- the kids' friends in school are probably like, "Oh, your dad loves fish, uh, weirdo." You know, there's a lot of things going on. But listen, all of my jokes aside, it was a really good movie. I recommend it. The octop- octopus, my teacher, is that my what octopus teacher? My octopus teacher. Okay. Yeah, it's good. I'm. Still- I didn't know. I, I didn't know octop- octopi. Is that the plural? Yeah, that's I did- the plural. Yeah. I didn't know that they were like that. I didn't know that they could recognize people. They're like as smart as cats. Apparently. Oh, they're smart as shit. Yeah. Did you ever yeah. see that? I remember seeing this a while ago. It was on, it was going around Instagram, but uh, there was a, I don't know if it was just out in the wild or if it was part of like a scientific experiment at like university or something, but um, the octopus used to be able to, like they would put a, a, like some type of treat, whatever it wanted inside of a jar mm-hmm. and then screw the lid on. And the thing learned how to unscrew the lid and get to the prize. Like, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was fucking, it was neat to watch it actually like wrap its tentacles around because it does exact, you're gone. Oh, wait, since we're nine minutes in and I didn't realize, uh, folks, every episode of this show is great, but we've got a <laughs> run of really great shows coming up. Tonight we're talking to Jonah Matranga of Far and New End Original and One Line Drawing. I'm excited about that. Far, Water and Solutions was one of the defining albums of my youth and even still today. And yeah. it's going to be a good discussion. I watched a movie uh, Sunday. No, 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 Saturday. The girls, yes. the girls and Kelly decided to take an excursion out to go get Halloween costumes. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and they have very specific things they want to be. So Kelly was like, you know what? That's actually a good idea. We'll just go to the thrift store and buy a bunch of old clothes because a lot of their costumes involve old clothes. And I was like, all right, cool. Mm-hmm. So uh, I had like an hour by myself. I was like, I'm going to start a movie while I'm folding laundry and like doing a dishwasher and shit. So I started uh, that Rob Zombie movie that came out in, I think, 2016. It's called 31. And Is that the radio station one? No, um, it's about f- a group of like five carnival workers and they are going to their next place. Like they're supposed to, you know, like meet the rest of the carnival there and mm-hmm. they get sidetracked and they get uh, basically kidnapped and put in this game. The game is called 31 and it's basically these five people have to survive for 12 hours. Uh, meanwhile, there's these group of, and I mean like aristocrats in like the most truest sense of the word, like powdered wigs and like, uh, cr- you know, cr- like, what do you call those things? Crevasse, cravat. I don't know. The, the, like the, pu- instead of wearing the tie, it's like that puffy handkerchief you put under your neck. You know? Oh, those things. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that fucking thing. So like they're dressed up like French aristocrats. It's fucking unreal. And those people are just, betting on who's going to be the last person to die wow. um so it's you know it's the same like kind of cast of characters that you have in all of them like his wife's in it and you know the, the same random people that you go oh okay but uh i literally was like not, i i mean i was paying attention to it i don't want to say like i was like not interested in it but i was doing something else while i was watching it and i i drifted off for probably like maybe a minute and then when i i came back they were still in the same place they're like about to get hunted by one of these murderers right mm-hmm. and the murderer shows up and i'm like that guy looks really familiar uh it was a skateboarder back from like the mid 1990s named poncho moeller mm-hmm. um he's a little person so he is the main character in the first third of the movie. Uh, I forget what his name is in the movie, but he's literally dressed in like Nazi regalia. Uh, he has no shirt on under it. He's painted white, kind of like a clown. And he has a huge swastika on his chest. So it was the most jarring thing in the world because I was like horror movie, horror movie, horror movie. And then I turned out like around and it's like, it's a dwarf with a fucking swastika on his chest. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? Did I, how much of this movie did I miss? Like I, I, he came (laughs) out of nowhere. Like, so, uh, I rewound it and I go, no, there's literally no introduction other than one of the aristocrats goes, I give you psycho head or whatever the hell his name was. And I was like, you, so it sounds like the, a horror version of the running man. It is. Yeah. It's exactly that same idea, but, um, not like televised type thing it's more yeah. just it's just for like three or four people's you know entertainment and they're like betting millions of dollars on who's going to win yeah i didn't see that one and i probably won't i don't watch a ton of movies so for me to check something out it has to reach the ranks you know what i mean i have to hear a lot about it yeah i have to see a lot about it and then i'll be like okay i, I gotta check this out yeah, I, I did that like that. It, I wouldn't spend my time on it again. Honestly, if someone it first of all, I'm glad it was free. Like, I'm glad I didn't rent it and spe- spend money on it. Yeah. Secondly, um, if somebody asked me like, hey, do you want to watch that movie again? It's not interesting enough that I would be like, yeah, I want to check that out again. It was a little it was like just off enough to for me to watch again. Like mm-hmm. it, it was just not not good. I was very, <laughs> I, I, and it was so, it was so upsetting, not only because I was like, oh, it's a Rob Zombie movie. I like the Devil's Rejects a lot. I like House of a Thousand Corpses a lot. I like the remake of Halloween. And, and then I fucking watched this movie. It's like the only hour and a half I have by myself. And I fucking watch a movie that's terrible. I was so mad. I was like, not only was the movie not good, I fucking wasted an hour and a half. I could have watched something. I could have watched the first half of Goodfellas. You've seen that enough. No. W- have you seen Midsummer yet? No, I have not. Dude, put put that next is, on your list. Is it on Netflix or Hulu? No. Okay. The real good shit isn't for a while. Yeah. Because it has clout. You know what I mean? They're yeah. not just going to throw it up there. I don't know. You get always like the, like, there's always like, we have new movies. And I'm going to look at it and I'm like. It's always the scrub shit. Pets 2. I'm like, fuck this movie. <laughs> fuck that. I'm not watching this yeah. shit. So like it, you're, you're not going to see Mulan up there. The new one. No, you're see no, 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 no. Pets 2. No, I actually, I, my daughters and I watched a little like brief thing about the making of it. 
and <laughs> we were like we're done watching and like it was like only like five or six minutes and i remember at the end evie goes i do not want to see this movie <laughs> i was like <laughs> good, me neither <laughs> i didn't like the regular mulan i saw that like you know 20 years ago i didn't like it but yeah all right folks we're gonna talk to jonah now so here it is enjoy all right folks we're here now with jonah matranga hey everybody jonah welcome thanks thanks so much absolutely thanks for being here this is awesome so how's it going today it's going good i did a lot of house cleaning and stuff today and I'm feeling very organized and yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I've got sometimes to me cleaning stuff up is just really good. Uh, I, I just went through like a bunch of crap that I was sort of in, that was sort of in limbo. So anyway, yeah, I'm feeling satisfied on that level. Uh, you know, I think we might be doomed as a species and I'm really scared about the election. I'm terrified and that's why I am doing some house cleaning because it helps keep my mind off of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm purposefully staying out of the news cycle because I'm burned out and yeah, and I'm just trying to stay positive and man, you just never know what's going to happen because I remember 4 years ago I live in this bubble in New York City and I'm like there's no way Donald Trump's going to win the election. It's just impossible. You know, everyone here is on the level. Everyone's cool. No one's this dumb. And just the complete unexpected thing happens. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the thing. I'm I'm actually putting out some music tomorrow and trying to raise some more money to, you know, donate to close races and to poll workers. And because, yeah, in 2016, I was, I just thought, no, there's no way he's going to win. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, I didn't slack off, but I, I have to admit, I did not take the prospect seriously. And this year I'm taking it very seriously and given more money and given more time and just kind of doing anything that comes my way that might at all help. Uh, because I just, yeah, I, I'm exactly. I'd never thought it could happen. And here we are. Yeah. So you said you're releasing some music. Let's talk about that. What do we got? An EP, LP? It's going to be a seven inch, um, so a seven inch download thing uh, that's got the one side is a song called Departure, which is like this big, heavy, sludgy thing that Jake from Minus the Bear played some guitar on. And this guy called Ian Prince, who is one of my favorite drummers in the world, uh, played the, some drums on and my friend Jeremy, who is also in Gratitude and New End Original with me is now a really great producer in Minneapolis. And so he and I have been working on a bunch of music. And so he mixed it all together. Um, and that's going to be one side. And then the other side is this really spacey kind of claustrophobic tune called hell of a year, mm-hmm. uh, that was written in the midst of all this crazy. Um, and that is, there's a couple versions of that song that are going to be out, but this one is a really strange kind of psychedelic one mixed and produced by my friend Dana Gumbiner from Sacramento. So long story short, lots of friends coming together to make some music that I'm going to sell to raise money for election stuff. Folks, this will be out by the time you're listening to this. So Joan is going to tell us where we can check it out. Right. So it it went on sale (laughs) (laughs) Um, on on October 20th. And I'm basically just going to sell it right up till... The election, I figure the money can go to close races and then poll workers and then protecting the results if we need to. So I'm going to just kind of have a thing going for a couple of weeks right up to election day. And it's sliding scale, sold on my site. And yeah, you get this rad seven inch and a couple of high res downloads of these really fucking cool songs. I'm super excited about it, actually. That sounds awesome. It sounds like a nice mix of music some awesome guests. And isn't it amazing how, you know, you're going through your life playing in these bands, meeting these people, and you, you don't expect all these decades later, you know, you'll be coming together with them to, to do this project. And I find that with this podcast too, like decades ago, being on tours, looking up to bands, talking to bands, and then I find myself sitting with them years and years later having these conversations. And when you when you look at it from that high level view, it's like, wow, I, I just... I just didn't expect things to end up here. 
Yeah, I, I got to say, I think my favorite thing about sticking around as long as I have, because um, this has been my job for a little over 25 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, and met, yeah, met a lot of people along the way, had a lot of good adventures. And this record in particular that I'm working on now, which is uh, these songs came from these sessions, um, but is all about that. It's all about collaboration and thinking, yeah, who have I wanted to make a song with? And so I've got a couple of friends from England that I'm working with and uh, a friend who plays a bunch of guitar down in Los Angeles and Jeremy over in Minneapolis and Jake from Minus the Bear showed up and uh, Zach from Jimmy Eat World played some drums on a song that's on the record. A couple of the other guys from Gratitude jumped in on a song. So it's a real family affair. Nice. Um, and I've had that feeling that you just talked about so often where I just think, wow, I didn't see, yeah, I didn't see myself rocking with the minus the bear dude on a track, but I'm really happy yeah. it happened. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't see you playing with Zach from Jimmy world on, you know, on a track and especially honestly this way, because I, I've still never really met Jake in person. We toured Jake from minus the bear. Um, his last name is Snyder. His last name isn't minus the bear. Um, <laughs> But uh, so I've never really, I mean, I met Jake a little bit when Gratitude was on tour with him, but not really. So I just wrote to him. Um, I th- I forget even what spurred it, but the strange thing about COVID days and all this is that this whole record is being made remotely. It's the most collaborative record I've ever made. Mm-hmm. And none of it is in person. <laughs> just so <laughs> it's uh, so who knows, you know, how things go. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I want to get into the you know, being able to record music digitally and with people in different states, I want to learn how to do that. I learned how to do it with this podcast. And the next step is going to be music because I haven't written any in a long time and I really want to. Yeah, it's super fun. It's, um, I'm, I've just had a blast making this record, just sort of sending off tracks to people and they send back this stuff that I ha- I just, it, it changes what I like, I send it to them not knowing what they're going to do, and mm-hmm. what they send back gives me more ideas, and then it gives it, it just it's a very interesting process. And but I recommend it to everyone, it's been it's been wonderful. And the record is going to be I don't know, it, it's it's going to be the most expansive record I think I've ever made in terms of heavy stuff, soft stuff. Um it's kind of like a band record and a solo record and a lot of things all, all mixed up in one. Um, so been pretty exciting. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We're, we're looking forward to it. So now we're going to take it back, Jonah. So tell us a little bit about where you grew up. Well, this being the Northeast scene podcast, um, <laughs> it's, it's a name only. Now we are international. We, we speak to everybody. Well, fair enough, fair enough. Yes. But I'm gonna. I'm still excited to be talking to nor'easters. Um, are you all? St- are you all still based in? Where are you based? Yeah, Tommy and I grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is yep. about thirty minutes north of Philly. Tommy is in Bucks County now in Feasterville, and I'm in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Cool. So still, still northeast. Um, so, so I was born uh, in Boston. Um, and my first house was in Cambridge. My family was living in Cambridge when I was born. And then we moved to Mission Hill, uh, which is also pretty much Boston. And then moved to Brookline, which is also pretty much Boston. Um, and so that was my first 18 years. And then I went to college on the West Coast and then have been West Coast ever since. So you never came back when you went to college? No, because my my mom and sister both moved while I was in college. I mean, my sister's my age, so I wouldn't have moved back to live with her anyway. Um, but basically, I had no family home left in Boston by the time I was done with college. So there, I have friends there, and I still visit there all the time and mm-hmm. catch a Sox game at least once a season. Um, and, uh, you know, just the things that one does growing up in Boston. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't have anywhere to go back to. So it was West coast for me since then. That's gotta be scary. Cause I, I was such a mess. The one semester I was away at college, I can't imagine 
like making it on my own and finding somewhere to live and I don't know that how how did you do it? It's good that yeah I mean I mean without shrinking myself too much I think not like a lot of kids when it, when a dad isn't around or when a parent isn't around um, I was already kind of uh, I grew up pretty fast I think in that way because yep. mm-hmm. I thought I sort of had to be the little man of the house kind of vibe. So when it came time to go to college, I, I think I was I was pretty ready to go already. I actually did come home for a semester, but that was just because I was not focused on school at all and I didn't want to be wasting my or my mom's money. Um, but it wasn't really a thing about missing home. And then I, I forget which year during college she moved out, but there wasn't even... Like I say, there wasn't even like I would then visit her a lot easier because she was just in California, too. Um, But after that, I I guess the main thing I remember, it's all around music, honestly, because when I got out of college, I thought this is the time I'd better try to do this. Uh, And so I, I moved up to Sacramento um, and started far up there with some guys from up there and slept on the bassist's floor and worked at Tower Records and did a very typical post-college being a rock band thing. And then the main junctures I remember are, I had, I remember I had a car, I had an Isuzu Trooper, um, and I sold it for like four grand. And at the time that was enough for me to live for like a year. Wow. Um, which is, you know, yeah, insane because now that's like rent for a month in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, uh, yeah, I was paying 140 bucks a month in rent. It was a very sort of simple little life. So I sold this car because I didn't have any other money and I wanted enough money to where I didn't need to worry about working for a year so I could really focus on music. And I figured if I ran out of money and still hadn't figured it out, then that would be a maybe a pretty good sign to try something else. (laughs) Um, So I did that. And then honestly, the next thing that happened was that I found out I was going to be a dad. And so that really forced my growing up hand. I think I was already kind of grown up anyway, because of being fatherless in that way. Yes. But finding out I was going to become a dad really lit a fire under me. How old were you? I mean, so I was in the summer of 94. My dad died in july i turned 25 in august and my daughter was born two weeks later wow so that was a that was a a, when everything that i was trying to do in sacramento really had to start working it i basically was making a living making music already but i was only making a living for me and my 140 bucks a month rent i was not making a living (laughs) that would take care of a kid and um so that was the next real stage so there were there were some I think I was conditioned pretty well to to do it. And then becoming a dad young was, uh, I mean, I suppose that could go a lot of different ways. I could have totally fallen apart. But yeah, again, I think growing up without a dad, I felt extra committed to like, I'm not going to fuck this up. Yeah. No, I did, I did. I did the same thing. So my father passed away when I was five. So when my daughters were born, I had twin six-year-olds and uh, a, a year old, like a one-year-old. And I did the like that instant click of like when i saw them i was like okay so i'm not going to repeat this like i i I need to make sure i'm around so like that's the point where i was like i need to start fixing shit in my life to make sure that i'm going to be present for theirs like yeah i I really remember hearing a voice in my head when i was sort of internalizing that i was going to be a dad and the voice just said no more falling apart yeah like just and just really not that I fell apart too regularly or anything, but I was a you know kind of a wild kid and stuff and was growing up figuring it out. And it just I just really remember that thought, this crystalline thought. And that's interesting that and I'm sorry to hear that you lost your dad at that age. I my dad didn't die at that age, but I, I lost him then and I I saw him twice more before he died over the next twenty years. But he left around around then two, three to five years old kind of thing. Um so yeah, that's an interesting shared pedigree. So how did he how did he pass if you don't mind our asking? Oh, it's it's totally fine. I've done lots of therapy. Um it's uh he I mean he just drank himself to death really slowly. He basically mm. died homeless. Um and again, I hadn't really I was in touch with him vaguely. We talked 
maybe a few weeks before he ended up dying, but we didn't know he was going to die. There wasn't anything like that. But he was living this life where basically since the time he left uh, when I was around five, I think, you know, I only saw him in person twice over the next 20 years. And then I would talk on the phone with him and send letters. But as I grew up, I began to understand that he was really going through different phases. He would be together for a few months and kind of have a shit together. And then he would fall apart again and I wouldn't hear from him. And then, he, you know, and when I was young, I didn't really understand why I wouldn't hear from him. But then as I got older, I was like, oh, okay, I see. My dad is a totally fucked up alcoholic and he's sort of gone through what he's gone through. Um, so by the time he died, we were still in touch. We were never estranged or anything. Um, but it was super sad when he died, but I got to say not that much of a surprise because I was very keen to the fact that he he was living a really rough life at that point. Right. Did that affect you in how you drink, if you drink? Because my friends who have situations like that in their family that are really bad, they just didn't start drinking at all. They were like, this is not for me. Is that the case for you? So I was between the ages of 12 and 17 when I was... Uh, you know, sort of from whatever that would be, sixth grade to a sophomore in high school, mm -hmm. junior in high school or something like that. I did more drugs than most people will do in their lives. <laughs> um, and alcohol was never a drug of choice per se, but it was on the menu. You know, yes. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was there, it was at the parties and I just, whatever the substance was, I could not get enough of it. Mm -hmm. And so I, Partly because of my dad, because I was starting to be aware of, oh, this is my hand of cards. Like my dad is an addict and however that runs in the family, it, it seems to be running in me. Um, and I was, but I was on, you know, in junior year, I was on probation and things were kind of one step away from shit. You might not come back from kind of thing. Yes. And so I quit everything is very, and this is a, an example of this kind of like precocious behavior of mine. I quit everything. Um, when I was yeah, 16 or 17 and didn't do anything, any drinking or any drugs for about 20 years, um, like into my mid thirties, I just kind of thought to myself, maybe I can revisit this stuff when I'm a grown up. But for now it's not working out well for me. You know, I'm getting arrested. Um, my dad's over there drinking himself to death. Like it, this is, I just had a moment of clarity, <laughs> which yeah. I feel very grateful for. Um, so I never started, by the time I started examining drugs when I was an adult and seeing about a more mature relationship with them, alcohol just never came back to being interesting for me. I had, in the ensuing years since quitting, I had seen a lot of people get really fucked up. My dad had died. I saw friends really screw up. I, I saw, you know, all the drama and stupidity that happens when people are drinking that you only really notice if you're not drinking. Yeah. Um, so I had seen so much of it that, that alcohol wasn't attractive to me anymore and opiates weren't attractive to me anymore. Um, so yeah, I smoke a little weed now and I do psychedelics once in a while because those always felt different to me than the other drugs, mm -hmm. but I never really went back to any of the other drugs. They just seemed like not a good idea for me. No, not with your history. And, you know, I, I totally feel you. I think it's great that you're able to make the choice and just be able to stop because yeah i feel real grateful for that yeah a lot of people can't i couldn't i for 15 years i went really hard and it got progressively and progressively worse to the point where i had to make a choice to change or i was going to die and at yeah, that point call, i did they call it hitting bottom yeah oh yes oh yes so yeah i feel you on that and yeah psychedelics are different like I would do them once in a while, like I would rent a cabin with some friends and we sure. would take them and walk around the woods and play sure. music. And, yeah, but man. then I found myself like, oh, okay, I'm going to take that, but then I'm going to take this to bring myself up. And then I'm going to take this to bring myself way down. And then I'm like, oh, uh, I don't think normal people mix all those drugs. Exactly. It, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it sometimes takes a minute to realize, oh, I'm doing more drugs than all my friends or, or, and maybe the friends I'm doing the same amount of drugs are like, they look pretty fucked up. I think I might be really fucked up too. You know, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of like, oh, um, yeah. So was Far the first band you were in or do you have other bands you were doing before that? 
I mean, I've been in bands forever. I think I, you know, we played the sixth grade talent show doing Stones covers. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> so I've always been into being a little rocker. Um, but Far For Sure was my first band that of any merit. You know, I mean, the other ones were just when I was in school kind of things with my buddies. Right. And did you start out singing and playing guitar? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was, I took guitar lessons. Like I'm kind of going back in my head right now. I I think I, I think I had maybe a couple lessons in a couple, like cello or some shit maybe when I was really young, but yeah, I was really into the guitar, but not the like wheedly wheedly guitar more. The guitar was the instrument that I first started to write songs on. And that Mm -hmm. was the thing I was the most excited about was sing. I would say, Guitar was a utilitarian thing. Singing was my sort of instrument of expression. And then, honestly, my favorite thing of all was recording and was just this song itself. When my friends were getting good at instruments or practicing whatever they were practicing, I was just home with my four track in headphone heaven. That was my main deal. That's great. Yeah. And I like when people get an early start like that, because I, I, I always wanted to be in bands, but it, it didn't happen. I don't know. I didn't get into my first band until I was like 24, and I didn't try to sing in a band until two years ago, I think. So <laughs> yeah. it, took, it took me a little while to build up the courage. What was your deal musically? Like, I, obviously, the alternative boom had a big impact on me, and then I got really into hardcore, and then post-hardcore, emo, post-rock, all those associated genres what was your trajectory sure so when i'm so i'm 51 so i was in high school from 84 to 87 and i was i you know i grew up in boston and so the thing about boston there was a very vibrant scene and I, we wouldn't go to shows or at least i wouldn't you know i was way too little and too young but I mean, there was literally a band called Boston, which was one of the biggest bands <laughs> in the world at the time. Um, yeah. And there was the Cars, there was Aerosmith, um, the Police and U2 both basically broke in Boston. Um, post-punk was just fucking massive there. And, you know, Mission of Burma is from there. Um, but speaking of hardcore and punk, I mean, one of my favorite early things um, was this compilation called This Is Boston, Not L.A., which was had like gangrene and the FUs and the proletariat and sort of all these badass punk bands from, from back in the day. And that was a big education for me. So it was like, I think I was basically a third raised on radio kind of cars, Aerosmith, Boston, U2, Polisi, alternative Rocky, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I guess I'll throw in the pretenders and the clash and REM um, and that kind of post punk 80s rock thing but more the alternative side of it for sure um and then and i was a big zeppelin kid zeppelin was definitely my my sort of they're my in my dna band Mm. um they were this rock band that put together all these different parts of me because like i also liked really weird kind of out there shit even at that age and i also loved songwriter stuff um So Suzanne Vega's first album was a huge deal to me. Again, she's from Boston, um, you know, from that scene, that you know, Massachusetts, New England scene. Tracy Chapman's first record was a huge deal to me. Again, East Mm -hmm. Coasty. So that was a big deal, and my Raised on Radio was a big deal. And then I had this little foot in kind of punk and hardcore. I didn't really know what it was, but I knew I liked the energy of it. It was just very exciting to me and didn't sound anything like what was on the radio. And so that was very interesting to me. So right from the start, I was pretty fucking ravenous um, yeah. for for a lot of different kinds of music. Again, the I was curious about how people sang and how people played fast and all that stuff. But I was mostly curious about songs in different ways of writing them and recording them and how these different people were making these different noises, whether it was super synthy, weird shit and drum machine stuff or, you know, rock and roll, you know, two guitars, bass, drums kind of thing. Um, or just a person and a guitar. And I think because that was so accessible, that was what I really started recording at first the most because I could, I could make a thing that at least in my head sounded kind of like a Tracy Chapman or Suzanne Vega song because it was just a guitar and a voice. Um, Whereas I couldn't make that noise 
we could rock in a rehearsal room and record it with a boom box, but I didn't understand what rock and roll sounded like recorded properly or how to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I, I was really drawn to singer songwriter stuff, honestly, because I could do it. I could, yeah, you could do it by it. yourself and it sounded yeah. like, yeah. I mean, it didn't, you know, in hindsight, of course, it sounded nothing like it, <laughs> but at the time it felt more within my reach. So tell us about the early days of far. How did it, how did it come together? Well, so I was in school down near LA at, at the Claremont colleges. I was at a tiny little school called Pitzer college. And my friends, uh, we're going. So my other Boston friends who had come out west to go to school were going to UC Santa Cruz, and so I would drive up to see them and play music with them. And um, they had a buddy called Malcolm who was either going to UC Santa Cruz or just hanging out. Um, and but he was from Sacramento, and so he was starting to play with a few guys from Sacto, and we got to talking. And I didn't know what I was going to do after college was over, and. I was looking for a rock band who wanted a singer who wasn't a traditional rock and roll singer. Um, And Malcolm and Sean and Chris uh, were looking for a singer who wasn't a traditional rock singer. And so they were, you know, Sean was into, he was definitely real into hardcore and punk and he schooled me on basically West coast punk and hardcore. Mm -hmm. And so he was into he was into he was in a band called Inner Strength, which was one of the early releases on Victory Records. Um, and so he was real into that whole world and real into Bad Brains. I remember he turned me into Bad Brains. Um, he Kevin Seconds from Seven Seconds had moved to Sacramento and was hanging out. So that was more for that influence. And then Chris and John were more into Primus and stuff like that. And and and, and I like that too. But I suppose, again, I brought the more songwriterly stuff to the band and maybe some of a little bit more of the out there elements to the band. Um, and Sean brought the the riff and the hardcore vibes. And John and Chris brought the sort of more college rock alternative nation thing. Nice. It so- yeah, it sounds like a, a different mix of, uh, of styles. And you, usually when you mix those together, you get something good. And that's a lesson I think about now. I wish I would have been a little more open to stuff when I was younger, because in my early bands, I'm like, no, it has to be this. And if it's right. not exactly right. this, I don't want to do it. But, you know, yep. that's how awesome things happen is working together with different people and different ideas and bringing them all together. It's certainly a way that it, that it can really yeah that it can happen it and th- that's really amazing and again i've just always been a person who i just i want to absorb all the good music and and then see what happens um but uh, i know a lot of people who aren't that way um i think you're probably in the majority but i was just a ravenous little creature yeah so can i ask you real fast jonah what did you major in in college i was an english major oh me too Nice, nice. <laughs> look, yeah, at look, at, look at us, father of the English majors. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you learning, know, that, learning to process and express ourselves. I, yeah, and I, I, I graduated, and I remember being like, "You were like, I'm going to start a band." I was going to be like, "I don't know what to do with this degree now." <laughs> I, right. If you want a fucking sixty-page paper on Dante, <laughs> like I got gotcha. you, but I don't know how you use this anywhere in the real world. <laughs> well, the funny thing about that is that. I was going to be a music major because I was so into music. And then an English professor of mine said, look, you can take all the music courses you want to and basically do all you would do as a music major. But if you are an English major, it's a more usable general major than music. Um, And she's like, just go with that. And that swayed me because at the time, as much as I loved music, I wasn't necessarily thinking I'm going to go and make music for a living. Again, I, I right after I got out of college, I thought this is the time to try this. But honestly, if that hadn't happened in those couple of years, especially when I found out I was going to become a dad, then I would probably have just gotten a teaching degree. That was my plan with the English degree. Like I was like, okay, cool. I've got this little liberal arts degree and if I need to add on to it, to uh, a teacher was really was my was my kind of my 
it is still kind of a second passion of mine. Honestly, it's it's one of those alternate lives that never happened. But I easily, I could have seen it happening. It's so sure. much fun. If when if, when you have a break, like when you take a break from music and you're like, I really just want to focus on something different. Lots of colleges offer them for like it's like six months, and you can get your teaching cert if you already have an existing bachelor's. It is some of the most fun times because you literally watch kids start to understand something on a deeper level. And you're like, Hey, I get to do this. Like, this is my job. It's very, very rewarding. So if you ever yeah, get the no, opportunity, I've, I, I, I will definitely, I kind of look, f I mean, music, <laughs> music just keeps working out, which, which is great. And I love it, but it's funny because, uh, I will see. We'll see. By the time yeah. I'm done with music, I might just not want to work at all. Yeah. But I have, I've had some really wonderful interactions with teaching over the years. I was a, teacher's aid, um, for fifth and sixth graders. I've played, uh, music and hung out a lot with like sort of preschool through kind of second graders. Um, I've in a lot of different contexts, like some around music and some around just like working with kids. I've gotten to some experience of that. I've never gotten the experience of teaching kids sort of, uh, above sixth, seventh grade. And, I think I would like it. I don't know. I might like all of it, but I have to admit the younger that the kids are and the more, like you say, I get to experience them learning how to learn and really yeah. basic shit like that. That has been the most interesting stuff for me. I think it's, there's something very powerful ab around, I don't know. I was just a really wild little kid. So I think there's something around being around, especially little boys and giving them boundaries and helping them learn yeah. how to be a decent human being <laughs> um, yeah. that, uh, that, that I is cool. And one way or another, I really do hope that I get to do more stuff like that in my life. I've thought a lot about some combination of guitar lessons and therapy where I oh, yeah. kind of like work with younger people through their creativity, maybe to, to get them to open up about some shit that they would not want to talk to a grown up about otherwise, you know, that kind of thing. I worked at a school a few years, well, a long time ago, about 10 years ago, and they had a music therapy program in the school and oh, it shit. was wildly popular. The kids loved it. Like the kids really, like they, they literally would be like, I have to take this class because if I don't take this class at this time, I can't go to music therapy. Like, Aww. yeah, they're so hyped on it. They loved it. I love that. Yeah, it's so really, rad, really nice. Man. I'm sorry. That was a complete aside. I just wanted to, like, I always, I when love people, it. no, no, this is it. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, yeah when people great. talk yeah. about college, I'm always like, I want to hear what your experience was because I know when I graduated, I was like, what the hell am I going to do with this? The one sure. thing my mother, I did say when I, when I left my, I was like, mom, I don't know what I'm going to do with this degree. And she was like, well, if there's anything I'm really sure of, you've gotten to be a way better speaker. And on top of that, she's like, I've seen your writing. You, It's cohesive. Like you can take something and synthesize it and make something new from it and write. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, that's nothing to, you know, kind of laugh at. Like that's a, that's a very real skill that people need. The only problem is, is that you got to find those people. <laughs> well, sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think one thing I'll say is that, and this is a, it's been a, a, a real it's really helped me out of some stressful moments sometimes when I've been not sure how things are going to go financially. Cause I've never gotten rich making music. I've just managed to kind of keep scraping and living out. Yeah. And so in the years when I was a little more freaked out about that, it did occur to me, especially as I learned about, <laughs> I mean, to what, you know, to say it as simply as I can about being a white guy, like, it just as a white person, period, and in particular as a white guy, if I am at all disciplined and have anything to say and any sense of, if I'm not a total fuck up, basically, there's going to be a way for me to make m money in this culture. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, we can, you know, and there's lots to talk about that in terms of, you know, the people who don't have such opportunities and such kind of a built in kind of ease of going through life. And I know that life is hard no matter what I really do, but it did dawn on me in not in a, like a political way, but in a just kind of a, in really a safety way, like, huh, for whatever it's worth, I've been born into a time where my skin color and my gender make at least making a basic living pretty easy for me. 
And it's just, you know, so, so no, no, it's okay. And, 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 and that's all to say that it's another thing to do something I actually enjoy and it's something that's interesting and all that. But in terms of actually just surviving, when it hit me that all I basically needed to do was like show up relatively consistently and I would be fine. Yeah. That was a big relief for me. It, um, yeah. I was going to say that like, it, if anybody ever thinks that kids that are living in the city have an easier time. I will show you like video of my Google classroom and you can see the lives. Like you literally have a camera into their lives. Yeah, man. And for a lot of my kids, life isn't fun and you can, it's, it's written all over their faces and it's, it's in the background and it's like, bro, it is so hard. Like, cause when people like, I, that's one of the other things with like my job is like, I, I am a white teacher at a predominant, not predominantly all black and Hispanic school. And it's very, this is a very strange time to work with my kids. But one of the things that's always been reassuring to me is my kids are always like, well, you're not white. You're Mr. Doherty. And I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? I, you just sold me for another 10 years. So that's fine. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's the whole thing is that yeah, whiteness isn't whiteness isn't about being white. Whiteness is about an attitude and an attitude of anti blackness, basically. Yeah. Um, and so I love that you that you have a window into that. And yes, I've heard some pretty heartbreaking things from my friends in education about what remote learning has illuminated about the digital divide, about the different ways that our different students live. And yeah, like again, we can. There's lots of conversations around this, and I don't want to get anybody up on their thing, but it, there's no way for anyone who has any sort of real world experience to say that basically the one's, one's fortune in life and one's money in life and one's resources in life don't at least predominantly run on racial lines. Um, and it's just a sad thing. It just, but it's been in the numbers forever. And I hope I hope, speaking of whiteness, that one way we're going to dismantle whiteness is just have some conversations about that that aren't based in like, fuck you, man, I'm white and I had it hard too. And, you know, I was poor too. And like, look, I grew up hell. I grew up way more poor than most of my black friends. Like we talk about our childhoods and we have this interesting thing because, yes, I was white, but I was dirt ass poor until basically until I was like nine or ten. Like our family was just fucked. Mm -hmm. And. So I get poverty and I do not undersell poverty. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's so difficult to have conversations with white kids who had it shitty because they're like, no way. I like my life was the fucking worst. But generally speaking, as far as I can tell, like there's always like whatever financial level you're at, like how light your skin is basically like gives you a better situation. Anyway, that's a, there's a whole, there's a whole world in there. Um, (laughs) But thanks for bringing in the remote learning thing because that is a big deal right now. And I've, I've heard from a lot of people that they're getting to see some kind of where their kids live. And it's, you know, because you're a good fucking human with a heart, you understand you, it produces empathy in you. And you understand like, oh, wow, I did not get this before this. Um, so way to be. But for uh, for our listeners that don't know, I don't. I, this is a statewide thing in California. You guys are virtual for the rest of the year, correct? Yes nobody's going to school this entire year will be at home like and we're going to adapt to it and we're going to fix it and we're going to make it work like i'm pissed they didn't have that when i was a kid i you, hated going to school keith you really, well I, all of us as being east coast people you know what this really means the demise of what no more snow days uh, oh, snow days are real. fucking over That's so <laughs> that, real. that was my first drug of choice like re- <laughs> Reading the school listing on the bottom of Fox Twenty Nine News and waiting oh. to see like your school. Oh, yeah. I used to have the so I used real. to have the ra- the radio next to me listening to KYW and that would, too. Holy shit, that was the best. My my mom would never let us watch the news because she's like, they were wrong once. Like what? Like nineteen seventy eight, they were wrong once about my sister's <laughs> school not being closed, and my mother drove in like a snowstorm to drop my sister off, and she was like, there was no school. She's like, they were wrong that one time. So every news every news outlet from this point on is wrong about the school closings i'm like all right now now we're in the northeast scene podcast right here (laughs) school closings this is it man snow days so jonah tell us about balancing being a parent and growing far how how do you find the time how are you growing a band while raising a child 
it was a it was a thing. Um, the first thing I did when I found out I was going to be a dad is get the guys together and say, because we were doing okay. We were like a big local band, basically. And I just said, we got to figure out a way to make more money doing this because I love doing this with you guys, but I'm not going to raise my kid in poverty the way I was raised. Like, I'm mm-hmm. not going to do it. Um, and so luckily we got signed. Um and I got, again, enough money to sort of at least take care of my daughter well. And um, it was a balance, though. I mean, I actually just I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book on it, basically, because, wow. um, yeah, you see, go English major. I used that yeah, shit. there you go. <laughs> I wrote a goddamn book. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I wrote a book about it because... And uh, what's the book? So we we can check it out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's plug it. Let's plug it. It's called Alone Rewinding. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's actually going to be up on Audible soon. I, I recorded the audiobook as well. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful paperback. And the audiobook actually comes with a bunch of songs from over the course of my life that, that uh, kind of help show my, the arc of my life in, in music. And so it, the, the recording starts with my high school talent show and kind of goes through everything, goes through early far stuff. And it's a neat document. I, I made it. I didn't know why I made it. I think partly I made it because I wanted to use my brain for something else than writing songs and see how that went. I, my nickname when I was a little kid was bookman. Um, so I've always, <laughs> I've always loved books we, and I, I think was thinking bookman from uh good times. Good I know. Times, Buffalo, yeah. but I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so, well, I wasn't Bookman for that reason. I was Bookman because I was the little kid in the corner reading the <laughs> books at the party. Um, but so I was, I've always loved writing and reading. Um, and so I was curious to to see if I could write a decent book. And then as I got into the middle of the book and did not want to keep going, I was very overwhelmed by it. I realized that if I finished it, that it would be this really great document for if no one else ever read it for my daughter to have and my family to have that is was my best shot at and it 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 remains my best shot at telling the story of what happened and what what happened to balance this life and how I was I managed to eke out a life as an artist but stay in touch with my daughter and stay present for her Mm -hmm. and so it was Honestly, it, w- before writing the book, I couldn't have told you at all. And now what I can say is that I just, the only time that I was away for more than a few weeks at a time was very early in her life. Um, I was married at the time and Sfar was going on tour and I I did not like it. I did not like being away from home for, uh, we would go away for, you know, maybe four weeks, six weeks sometimes um, on these long van tours. Um, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy calling her from pay phones. I didn't enjoy not seeing her grow up, you know, in the, in that infant stage where like two weeks, she's grown like eight years kind of thing. So that was no fun for me. Um, the marriage ended, um, and I then after that, I pretty much toured, kind of around my child support schedule. So after that, I would still tour a ton, but it would be two, three weeks at a time. And that was a big way I balanced it, which is not a traditional way of being a touring musician. Most of the time it's going away for months at a time. And I never went away for that long. And then increasingly as she got older, I did not want to be away for long periods of time. So that's basically how I balanced it was I'd still be doing 200 shows a year, but it would literally be like hang out with my daughter for, you know, five days. Uh, then she's with her mom for a couple of weeks. I'd come back, you know, and it was sort of that back and forth, back and forth the whole time. And so it was kind of a crazy life, but it did allow me to do both basically. Yeah. And that's, that's awesome. great because typically, you know, someone will just go on tour and that's it. I got to do it. They're gone. Exactly. Exactly. Or the band ends. It's like, oh, uh, my wife is having a child. I can't right. do the band anymore. So, exactly. so you make the decision with the band. We got to make more money. What did you do? Because, like, like how do well, you that, do that? That's that's when we got signed. No, I mean, the, really, what I said was because we were already doing okay locally, and it was right. again, it was fine for me alone, but it was not nearly enough money 
to, yeah, to just have any sense of security as a father. And so it was really all about getting signed. And it, it, at that time in the mid nineties, I mean, a lot of people were getting signed. It was post Nirvana. Mm -hmm. Um, alternative rock was a thing. No big labels really knew what was going to be popular because you had these real weird bands getting massive, you know, had Nirvana and Janes and Primus and, um, just these chili peppers. It was sort of early MTV too. And that, that was allowing for these really weird bands to, to get big. So, and it was, you know, at the time looking back on it now, it was at the time where the music industry was the most bloated. There was just the most money around and I basically just said to them, we got to figure this out. And we had like a manager at the time uh, who was, you know, basically our buddy. And he was very uh, Eeyore about the whole thing. He just did. He was uh, he, he thought it was never going to happen. He thought we were too weird. <laughs> and I just thought, why not? Like, why not us? I see all these other bands getting signed. They don't seem that good. Right. Um, because, I mean, obviously, the really popular ones I did think were that good, and they were that good. But there was a lot of bands that weren't that good getting signed. They weren't necessarily, <laughs> you know, getting a hit, but they were getting these, like, fucking hundred, two hundred thousand dollars advances. Wow. And wow. it was just a very different time in music. So I think Far's first record, we got, what did we get? Like, maybe 150000 as an advance, and we put, you know, we had to spend about half of that making the record, but then we got to split the other half of that. But then also back in the day, you had publishing deals, which don't really exist anymore like this. But so we got a publishing deal that was also another 150 grand or whatever it was that we got to split. So basically, long story short, I ended up with, I don't know, like 40, 50 grand in my pocket that, which to me at that time in my life was just millions of, I mean, it just... (laughs) It was it was enough for me to breathe, you know, and go, I'm going to be OK. Based on what you've told us, it seems yeah. like you were pretty responsible with money and could make it last. I was, again, growing up real poor. And I just, I really valued money when mm-hmm. it was around. Um, it was, and I just, I also grew up kind of a hippie and um, from a very early age. And so it really, I've never been... I've never been that into material things, even, even musical gear. I've never, I buy it, but I've never bought really expensive stuff. I've never owned a new car. I've never had a dishwasher in my house. I've never had laundry machines in my house. Mm-hmm. I I just live real simple. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I would say Hannah's early years um, were the years I was spending the most partly because when I got divorced, you know, I was paying child support, which I was happy to pay. And, um, it, but that was, that was when I was spending the most. I mean, um, and then of course I was saving to make sure Hannah would be able to go to college and, you know, if she wanted to and all that stuff. And so I was just being, yeah, I was being real, real thoughtful. And a lot of that was around being a young dad because I just knew I had to be, I had to figure this out. And that was my main priority. And I think I was a little scared. I think I was so scared of ending up really poor that I actually saved well. And then by the time I sort of, sort of uh, was looking at money in a more realistic way, I realized, okay, good. I've, I've learned how to do this. Okay. Like I know how to budget my money and all that stuff. So, yeah. Right. So you're still growing the band now because of the tour schedule and having to take two weeks off here and then jump back on. Did that cause any problems in the band? Oh, yeah, it was horrible. No, I mean, it, it yeah, it essentially it didn't break up far, but it was certainly caused more than a few fights. And it uh, I was I was really never able to to be in a band for too long. And part of that was because we would inevitably run into this thing where we'd be offered a tour mm-hmm. and I wouldn't want to do it, um, even if it was a real good tour. Um, and I've turned down a lot of tours as a solo artist as well, but there's no one to be mad at me for that. Um, except my booking, (laughs) booking agents and managers, I guess. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was, I I was part of the reason far broke up is because I was in such a different part of life than the rest of the guys. I mean, I was a dad and I was first married and then getting divorced and, you know, it was all this intense shit happened and the other guys were you know, I think I was, what was it? So I was 21 when Far started and Sean was 
maybe 18 and Chris and John were like 16. Wow. Um, Malcolm, actually the first bassist in far was actually my age. Um, but he left, uh, real, real early in the band. And then John came in, uh, who was a friend of Chris's basically, but cause they were in high school together. Um, so the reason we had a big draw locally at first was because Chris was in high school and all his buddies would come out to see us rock. <laughs> um, so yeah. So anyway, um, Yes, I have in bands, I think, is this true? Yeah, in any band I've ever been in, so in Far, Gratitude, New End, main bands, all that time, no one else in the band was a father. Hmm. Uh, so I've had a very, very different lens into music and being a musician than most musicians have, for sure. Right. Well, it's it's good that you're splitting the time. I mean, I think that's rare to make sure you're there and that you're uh, supporting your kid. It's very rare. I mean, I think we all know, yeah, fathers that have put their creative dreams aside and moms, you know, like like uh, there's parents that have put their creative dreams aside. And then there's other parents that haven't put their creative dreams aside, but then they end up being pretty shitty parents. So I was trying <laughs> I was trying to be, you know, again, to, I was trying to be both. And yeah. it wasn't always simple, but it worked out. And I feel very, very grateful. And in fact, what I learned writing the book for sure is looking back on it, being a father helped my music be more focused because I, anytime I would play shows, I really wanted them to count mm -hmm. and because it had to be worth going away. And then because I would go away when I came home to be a dad, I would I would be at all the Hannah school events and stuff. And I would just sort of soak that up. And it, it kind of is as strange as it sounds. It helped me be more present in both parts of my life. Um, which again, it doesn't always work that way, but it happened to work out that way for me. And I feel very, very lucky about that. That's an awesome way for that to work out. Especially like when you see you, you know, especially when you're split between essentially two different worlds and you're able to go, okay, I can use what is seemingly like a difficult, like, or an ops, you know, some type of obstacle yeah. and use it to uh -huh. be like, you know, not only facilitate in one, but like really help you in both worlds. It's really cool. Yeah. I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of things in this life I'm not good at, but something about, I had what it took to do that. I had it in my brain. I had the drive to do it. Um, and I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky uh, that that I was able to pull that off. And I don't exactly know what the skill set was involved in that, but I do know a lot of people haven't been able to do it. And yeah. it's one of those kind of times. I just kind of, yeah, I just kind of say thank you and keep it moving, honestly. <laughs> so I think I got into FAR around, let's say, 99, 2000. And I, I was heavily into hardcore, and then I got into some emo stuff, and that's when I discovered all the post-rock and post-hardcore stuff as well, and Far was in there. And Water and Solutions, to me, is an all-time classic record, and when I recorded my first EP in my first band, I actually gave them Water and Solutions for the, uh, the bass tone, for uh, mm -hmm. Wear It So Well. That's a yeah. gnarly bass tone. It is a good bass tone. <laughs> I mean, well, that's all. That's all. Sardi, D. Sardi, he produced Water and Solutions, and he's uh, he's something else. Um, and it's it's definitely um, it remains my favorite thing I've made. I think this new record uh, it might eclipse it. It, it is really high fi and really exciting to me mm -hmm. um, in ways that I've never really been able to pull off since water and solutions and in fact it's kind of got more to it because it's it's not just a a, a hard rock record um a post hardcore record like water and solutions was but um anyway water and solutions is i it's one of those records that i know i made it and i love it for that reason of course but it's one that i will definitely stand behind um it's it's i think it's aged really well mm -hmm. um and i feel very very proud of it so i, I appreciate you mentioning it as well you should, yes. It stands the test of time. So set the stage for us a little bit around that time. We're going in to record the record. I mean, how are the shows? How is the band? Is is everyone excited about the future? 
Uh, no, no. <laughs> the, I mean, we, we were fine. You know, our shows were fine. We, no one really understood what we were doing. We were playing with bands that we really shouldn't have been playing with. I mean, we were on a mortal record. So our bandmates were corn and incubus and the urge. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so we were getting paired up with bands like that. Um, just the whole sort of like, it was just, we were just in between worlds. We weren't cool enough for the indie kids. We weren't hardcore enough for the hardcore kids. We weren't sort of dreadlocked and Adidas enough for the, you know, that scene, that sort of like funk punk thing that right. was happening. <laughs> Um, so we didn't really fit anywhere. I mean, we, we grew up with Deftones and Sacramento was actually this wildly diverse musical ecosystem. You know, Kevin was around doing seven seconds and all of his amazing bands. Cake was coming out of Sacramento at the time. So they were doing this very strange acoustic kind of folky something thing. Um, Deftones were doing their thing. And so we were influenced by all of that stuff happening. And mm -hmm. I, in particular, was so excited to play an acoustic show one night and then go and play with Deftones the next night and all that. So we were a mess. So that all, all that's all to say that we made tin cans. It hardly sold the thing. Mm -hmm. um, the We weren't even sure we were going to get a second record. It was actually, I, I sent some home demos to Sardi when we were trying to find producers and stuff. And those were the first and the home demos had, I don't know, my like a home demo of Waiting for Sunday, a home demo of a Mother Mary. Um, and Mother Mary in particular caught some ears and kind of helped the record get made. I mean, we had sent the label stuff and they were supportive enough, but it was not it was not clear that we were gonna that we were gonna be able to do this, honestly. It came together in it a did. big way. It, it did. It, it was so. Yeah, and we we got to go make the record. It was really fun to make it, but expectations were <laughs> no one. No one was waiting for the big hit single. They were <laughs> they were hoping something would happen, but it, it was expectations were measured. Let's say that. Let's put it that way. Did the band expect big things from the record? No. Or no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, no. We had we had basically. We weren't dejected per se, mm -hmm. but we, I think we were probably more excited when Tin Cans came out because our first major label record, right. you know, it was this, 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 this first time around this, you know, this adventure of, of putting a record out in a real way. And then when that was such an abject failure on so many levels, going into our second record we were like well what's going to be different basically but we, we were still the same band we were still making this weird post-hardcore not fitting anywhere kind of music mm -hmm. so i think the good part of it and maybe why we made a record that we ended up loving so much is because we had grown as a band we were open to being produced more mm -hmm. um at tin cans we did not know what the fuck to do and uh a guy called Brad was making the record with us and he was wonderful, but we just didn't listen to him. And we listened to Sardi because he had made these records that sounded so incredibly good. And so we made a record that we loved, but as far as how would the world like it? Uh, we, we really, we, we had pretty much cemented this vision of ourselves as like, we don't really fit in any scene. We were sort of somewhere between Radiohead and Deftones and Pearl Jam and, you know, whatever else we were like that, would sounded sort of like us, but again, we just, we didn't fit anywhere and we all knew it. Yeah. And it's, it's a tough gig because I, that type of sound I would say is probably my favorite, but it's hard because it's, it's a little too hard for the mainstream crowd and it's right. a little too light for the heavier crowd. So you're just, you know, you're, you just don't really fit in a lot of the time. Well, yeah. I mean, one of the strange things about when after far broke up is, is, if we had even lasted a few more years, I think the exact sound we were making would have had a lot easier time getting into the world. Um, mm -hmm. That sound, well, I mean, emo became a thing called emo. Um, yeah. I remember there was, you know, some magazine in mid to late nineties that, um, that called me the emo king. 
And, <laughs> and, and that was, and all my friends joked with me about that. I was the king of something that no one knew what it was. Um, but of course, cut to 2002 and emo is a word and then cut to 2020. And it's even like kind of a emo is like dropped in all kinds of contexts. And it's oh, very, yes. it's very strange. So, but at the time, yes, what we were doing was no one understood at all. So how did the band come to an end? What was the conversation? Where was everybody? We pretty much broke up on tour. Um, mm -hmm. At the beginning of the tour, I had said, hey, I think I want to, I'm right. Basically, well, I'm writing these songs and I tried to, you know, get the band to play them and they didn't like them. I had written like 14 to 41 and Hostage and a couple other songs that I knew were good, mm -hmm. uh, but the band didn't like them basically. Um, and so I said, hey, I just want to. And we were all really burnt out. We were sort of, you know, trying to tour on Water and Solutions. We were on tour with, you know, Monster Magnet and Life of Agony and bands that, again, just, it really didn't fit with what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And especially I didn't fit. And so I had a, you know, I just said to the guys, after we do this tour, because it seemed like that was going to be the end of the album cycle for Water and Solutions, basically, because mm -hmm. the money was running out and the label was kind of giving up on us. And I just said, why don't we just, you know, just catch our breath a little bit. I'll go make a little kind of like, you know, lo-fi songwriter record and get this out of my system and then we can write more songs and we'll, let's see where we're at. And I think a lot of the guys, I don't know, who, you know, who exactly, like, because it's so many years gone by. I think Sean in particular, though, he was very threatened by that. He thought I was going to leave the band. He thought I wanted to break up the band. And it wasn't what I wanted at all, but it really put a stressful feeling around the tour. Um, so there were some fights on tour and we, yeah, we played our last show in Chicago and kind of drove back home from there. And it was a pretty, it was a pretty quiet drive home. Yeah. Um, and so we didn't officially break up then. I would say when we officially broke up is when, um, we got offered another tour supporting this one would have been, uh, it would have been us and Incubus and System of a Down. And it was before System had broken. It was before tox toxicity had come out. Right. So it was incubus was going to headline. They were a little bit ahead of the curve at that point. And system and us, we were going to, one of us was going to open and one of us going to be main support. And we didn't really know what was going to happen. But the point of that is to say that I was so fucking tired of going out, supporting these bands where the audience just like wanted to beat the shit out of me basically um, <laughs> so i i just I, I when i and when i turned that tour down i remember our manager at the time and and sean both being uh, like on a call with me trying to convince me to do this tour and i said no i'll, I'll like go out and headline like do like headline small clubs and be yeah. with like be with our people but i don't want to go and play these you know slightly bigger shows where no one gets what the fuck we're doing it just didn't it didn't appeal to me and again i was I was, you know, at that time, Hannah was five years old. She was really kind of coming into her own. I had, I was recently divorced. I was like, I just needed to, I, I, I needed to fucking take a, take a beat. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that pretty much ended the band. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I understand because it would, I know myself, it would kill me to go out with these bands time and time and time again. And just no one cares and watching bands that I don't think are as good, you know, going on to bigger things it would it would kill me and i think you have to do that i think you have to do a smaller headlining tour to build yourself up that's that's what steve martin did because he was opening for people and someone told him here's some small clubs do these and headline and he saw his shows grow and grow after that so i don't know i think i think that's the way to go yeah that's an alternate universe that i wish we had explored i, I wish <laughs> that we hadn't broken up I wish we had been able to take a breath and take a rest and take some time apart from each other. Right. And, and then, yeah, just really focus on being the weird band that we were. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think water and solutions has aged really well. And I think it would have aged even better if we were continuing to tour on it and let it grow. And, and that the type of music we played was getting more and more popular and that would have happened. And mm -hmm. I think it could have been, a really, really interesting and lasting thing. And I don't, I'm not sure we ever would have been as massive as Deftones have become or Incubus. Um, but maybe we would have been, I, you know, um, it, it, you never know. Right. Uh, it's just, it's just one of those other lives. Um, 
that that I don't I don't wish it would have happened, but it could have been cool. It could have been cool. Yeah. What, what's it like to did, did you ever you guys played with corn a lot or uh sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> what are they what are they like in real life are they like because i just imagine them like cartoon characters like when you meet them like <laughs> yeah i mean yeah so the first time i remember the first time seeing corn uh at the time I, it was a strange thing because they were on our label and they seemed nice enough i suppose but i was very protective of deftones um and I just thought Corn was just this horrible, ridiculous kind of white snaky version of of Deftones, you know, where yeah. where the different characters that the Deftones guys actually were, the Corn guys. I mean, I don't know who they were outside of the band or whatever, but they just seemed like yeah, again, cartoon versions of this other band that I thought was really special. Mm. So I I didn't I didn't give them too much credit. Um, and I didn't really get to know them for that reason. I just kind of didn't like them in that way. And we would we would play with them. And again, their audience wouldn't get the f- fuck was going on with us. And, um, <laughs> oh, it was corn fans. They they were right. That's right up your alley. <laughs> I mean, exactly. You know, it's like, what am I going to do with that? You know, like and, just a bunch and what, of and, just a sea full of track jackets. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they don't want to see me like singing in falsetto and talking about my feelings. Like, it's just not, you know, uh, so it was. It was never anything personal, but, you know, they were just doing like a much more rock dude thing than I was. Um, And yeah, years later, I actually ended up being on a, you know, I was touring, I think alone. I think it was a one line drawing tour. And I was playing on a festival in Europe somewhere. Maybe it was New End Original. Either way, it was the early 2000s. And Korn was headlining this massive European festival. And I just, they looked so just sad and dead eyed. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were, they were there playing for a hundred thousand people like doing their thing. And, and they just, they just looked dead inside to me. Like I, I, I you know, saw them back there. I was like, Hey, you guys, how you doing? You know, cause we were never, I, I never didn't like them or anything. I just didn't hang out cause we weren't kind of the same kind of people right um we weren't doing rock and roll in the same way and but it was the 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 years to me had not been very kind to them i hope they're all doing better now i know they've all been through some really crazy shit and you know and there's a couple books out there (laughs) yeah fieldy has one called got the life (laughs) right and you know that all like those like yeah the scene around them just the energy around them at that festival it felt really fucking creepy like it just felt really decadent, but not even in like any fun ways. It just felt like, yeah, it, it freaked me out. It's still to this day. It kind of gives me a shiver to think about just the way, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's truly like, I really mean it. Like there, it was so sad to see these people that were, you know, younger than me who just looked defeated. tired and old and yeah, and defeated. And, and, and there they were headlining to a hundred thousand people. Like they were all, all the dreams that I had ever had as a rock person, they, it had come true for them. Yeah. yeah. And I was the one who was happier running around <laughs> with my little guitar. Um, I mean, I guess I don't really know, but they didn't seem happy. They didn't seem happy. That yeah. world can chew you up and spit you out, it seems like. That's why so many people who make it go nuts. Yes. I yeah. think that's a, it's an astute observation. I've, I've tried to talk about that to anyone that will listen, is that there's a reason that, so many famous people hurt themselves and do awful behaviors and do a bunch of drugs and, or, you know, because it's a weird life. It is, it's beautiful. And we have these, uh, these imaginations of what that life is like, but the, the reality of the life is not at all what a lot of people think it is. And it's one of the reasons I've done my career the way I have is because I've seen some people really fall apart and I have not wanted to be that person. I always think of Dave Chappelle on Inside the Actor's Studio. He kind of talks about his experience and how everything went wrong and how he ended up taking a little sabbatical in Africa. And he said something like, you know, why do you think Martin Lawrence was running around in traffic, wa- waving a gun around saying they're coming to get me? He's like, it's, it's, it's bad. It's a bad scene. 
I, I actually always think of, uh, do you remember when everybody was like, oh, Jim Carrey went crazy. He's going crazy. Yeah. I, I saw an interview with him and he said something really profound. And I was like, that I really respected. He went, I wish everybody could get rich and famous for just a little bit of time to see that it's not the answer to anything. Right. And, that's right. That's and I right. think that's where a lot of that comes from is people think like, oh, fuck, I got here. This was what I've been looking for the whole time. And it's like, that wasn't the problem. Yes. Like, you, you need to work on fixing your shit. Like money wasn't going to fucking fix it. A car wasn't going to fix it. A, you know, world tour isn't going to fix it. Like you got to fucking do that work. Like, and it's really hard when you see that happen to good and well-intentioned people where you're like, wow, they were making something they really loved. And it, it quite literally drove them crazy. Thank yeah. You. I actually, I remember that Chappelle actor studio thing. That's, uh, that was a very, very influential thing to see um yes. is is yes yeah, seeing him and i remember that martin lawrence quote like i, I that's interesting to you brought up that specific reference because that was a real eye-opener for me and then definitely seeing my friends not be happy when they're having lots of success and then in recent years you know shit man chris dying chester dying i mean obviously lots of you know we've lost lots of amazing musicians but i mean the younger guys yeah mm-hmm. um and the guys who i basically grew up you know, playing with or, or alongside, um, and seeing them, yeah, just literally fucking die. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. It's a thing. And I'm very, 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 very happy that I avoided that. And again, I think that comes down to being a father and, and knowing that I wasn't going to have this life like other people. I didn't realize it at the time, but that was so good for my mental health. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I I want to jump ahead a little bit to make sure we get this in. But so, I'm, yes. you know, around the year 2000, I discovered some of the classic emo bands of the mid 90s, and it became some of my favorite music. I got heavily into Texas is the reason. Yeah. I got heavily into Far. I got heavily into Quicksand, Mineral, all the good shit. And, you know, in the year 2000, none of these bands existed anymore. They were legends. I only heard stories about them. I would hmm. buy VHS tapes on, on eBay so I could just see them because, you know, YouTube wasn't around yet, right? You were going off of word of mouth. So I hear that Jonah from Far is forming a new band with Norm and Scott from Texas is the Reason. And oh. I, I, it was like a custom tailored dream for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how that band came together. Uh it's all Norman. Yeah. Um he he and I had been writing back and forth. He was actually at the last far show, very interestingly enough. Uh oh. and we he was living in Chicago at the time, so we got to talk and then um and I think I was just sending him songs because I loved his ear and we love to talk about music. Mm -hmm. And at some point he said, these songs are band songs. Um, I think we should get a band together to play them. Um, So, cause it was basically, I was just getting ready to make another one line drawing record basically. Yeah. He, no, he, I mean, he obviously brought in Scott from Texas and then Charlie, I, I think I might've brought in Charlie because I was on tour with Sergio from Quicksand actually was doing a little solo thing and Charlie was playing drums with him and I fell in love with Charlie's drum playing. And I think I said to Norman, Hey, and, and Char, uh, and Norman knew split lip and Chamberlain, Charlie's earlier bands mm-hmm. and knew what a great drummer he was. So, but yeah, it was essentially Norman was, uh, was the engine for new and original. Um, and, yeah, he continues to be. He's actually working a lot on this new record with me and Jeremy in the same way he's always been with me. He's just, he has an incredible ear and he is, he knows me really fucking well at this point and he knows how to call me on my shit and he knows how to uh, kind of get the best out of me, honestly. Um, when I make shit with Norman, it's just better. Um so that's new end is when I learned that. Um, it's all it's all him. Yeah, it was an exciting time, an exciting band. I did get to catch you guys live one time, and it was just it was just incredible to see these people in real life and to to hear this new awesome music. There, 
that they were making. It's uh, it was a very memorable show for sure. I'm so so fucking psyched to hear that. Where do you remember where it was? It it was at the first Unitarian Church in Philly. Yes, and I remember yes. there was this rug on the ground that looked like a like a roulette wheel or something. Yes, and you were like, oh, does anyone bet? money to see like where the hardcore front man is going to jump and you were like (laughs) jumping up and down on the rug it was funny (laughs) that's awesome i love the first uni i've i I think i'm one of the few artists that's played every space the first uni has to offer um but i I remember that new end show quite well actually just because i love first uni so much so that's rad yeah so that band seemed like it had so much promise. You had the killer first <laughs> LP. What happened? It seemed like it, it was like done in what two years? Oh, if that it was it was fast. Um, I mean, again, I was in a very different place than most of the guys. Um, it made touring weird. Um, I can't that that one ended so suddenly. We were we were on tour in Europe and. We had some fight about something, but it was mm-hmm. a pretty average kind of band on tour, tired fight. And I forget it was Charlie or Scott, but they were both seemed like kind of cooked on playing music, period. Um, and so I don't know. I never really like I'll always love them because we, we you know made this music together and stuff, but we never really got to know each other the way I knew the guys in FAR. And I knew Norman better, of course. But so Charlie and Scott left and then me and Norman were, you know, we actually did some touring after that. And we were talking about making another record and it just never, we're both guys that we like to, we kind of think the band is who the band is and it's tough to just replace people. Yes. Um, And there was something about it where we just never got back to the feeling of that first new end configuration. And so it just kind of died out. Both, both Norman and I, we were, we started getting interested in other things. He started getting interested in DJing and house music. And I was obviously still doing one line drawing and all my solo stuff. So Mm -hmm. it just kind of drifted. Um, but that first record, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really proud of it. I mean, I think the only thing I wish about the first, that first record is that we would have taken a little longer to record it. I think it's got a great urgency, but, um, yeah, there's just, there's just, I kind of wish we would have, we, we recorded in two weeks and I, if we just had four weeks or something, um, but either way, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, but so yeah, that new end came and went real fast. Um, yeah. Well, it was a big, bright, quick burning star. It's a that's great right. LP. Right. It's got some Thank real you. bangers on it. 14 okay. to 41. That's one of my favorites. That is, that's, that's, I, well, I, I think I only think this because of kevin um but kevin seconds that's his he that's his favorite song of mine and he's gone so far as to say that's a fucking perfect song and yeah a a songwriter like that saying that about a song it definitely helps me believe in it so i do think that's one of i I think yeah i think uh i was just talking with norman about record sequencing because we're sequencing this this new album right now and Mm -hmm. um i was saying that the the you know, lukewarm 14 to 41 hostage is a, like a first three songs on a record. Yeah. That's, I feel, I feel good about that. (laughs) I feel good about it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think if, uh, I think if multiple members of Texas is the reason are together in a band, they just have to stay out of Europe. Cause like, look what happened to Texas and new end original. I think Norman might have joked about that at one point, actually, now that you say it. I, I hadn't remembered that until you said that, but I guess that's true. Um, <laughs> I think Norman has totally joked about that very thing. That's very funny that you said that. Is Norman guesting on the uh, the new record? Well, he's guesting in his own way. There's actually, okay, this is kind of funny, actually. A, a song that we were writing for the second New End record that never got finished we finally finished it. And that's actually the one that Zach from Jimmy Eat World plays drums on. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really excited about it. It's, it sounds so fucking good. But so Norman, uh, he, he's just not playing guitar that much anymore. And he, and because of lockdown, there was, he has no way to record it real well where he lives. Mm-hmm. So he basically, it, he basically taught Jeremy over the phone or whatever zoom or whatever they did 
all of the guitar parts. And so Jeremy performed it, but he essentially, so like Jeremy was sort of like Norman's like rock guitarist proxy, you know? (laughs) Um, So Norman isn't physically on the record, but he's definitely, you know, he, you know, we wrote that song together and he's, we were just talking the other day about what is he doing for this record? And cause he's not, you know, he's not mixing it and he's not writing it with me and he's not playing on it, but he's this super big part of it. I mean, he's essentially made the sequence for the record, um, helped edit some of the songs, helped me realize what I wanted to do with the songs. He, it's sort of like he's a, and he's obviously just my friend and I love him, but yes, um, he's a really big part of the album, but we don't exactly know what to say he's doing. Cause he's just, <laughs> he's just being him again. He's just got really great taste and a really great ear and he just makes things better. So he's just the make things better on the record. But yes, he's a huge part of it, but not as a guitarist. You know, I didn't realize it until I saw Texas is the reason on that most recent run of shows they did, but he's just an incredible guitar player. He sure is. Like he's a, unbelievable. Yeah. And he, Texas is the reason and his guitar playing specifically one, kind of taught me how to play guitar, and two, just really, really heavily influenced the the, every, the way I write. Well, I mean, I will totally pass that on to him. Um, he is. He's, a, he's actually, I don't consider myself anywhere near as good a guitarist as him, but we're similar guitarists in the sense that we're not technically trained, and we just love to get our ideas out through the guitar. But my ideas come out a little bit more as a like a combo of voice and guitar. It's kind of one instrument for me. Right. And him as a guitarist, yeah, he just, he writes these really beautiful, intricate parts. And that's another thing too, is that his chops aren't up um, right now. And so it was, aside from not having the gear, he was like, I don't want to fuck this up. Like this song is finally getting recorded. And like, I feel rusty. So, um, but you'll hear it. I mean, it's such a Norman guitar part. You'll, you'll, You'll know when you hear it. I'm excited. I've actually been pestering him online to come on the show, and I will continue to do so until he agrees. <laughs> well, I will, I, will, I will pester him for you. I'll say, hey, these guys are saying super sweet things. You should totally go talk to him, and, and I think he will. We appreciate that. Of course. <laughs> so did you start up one-line drawing right after FAR? Yeah, that was just a real natural thing. It was just, um, again, I had these, you know, I, I had written 14 to 41 and better than this. And, you know, sort of those, some of those early one line drawing songs and the band didn't like them and I really wanted to record them. Mm-hmm. So I just, and I didn't really know what I was doing and I, but I was sitting there on my little website talking to people back in the days of websites, um, which I'm trying to bring it back, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm so over social networks. And so my website, I'm really trying to build it out because I figure anyone who really wants to hang out with me can come to the website. And other than that, I'm good. A brief aside, I'm really glad that when we spoke, you directed me to the website to email you. Cause I, I had this same thought process after I did that. I was like, fuck, there's not websites anymore. Everything is controlled by Facebook or an application. There's no more independence. You know, everything has been commoditized and it's kind of sad. Between networks and Spotify, it's just really, really tough to have a a place in the world as an artist that's not basically on, on someone else's property. Um, right. What I think is cool about the internet is that we can all have a little home on the internet, but we're all like renting space on social networks now. But all of our data is theirs. You know, it's just, it's a bummer. So I'm <laughs> being a, my little army of one trying to have a different kind of thing. I like that. And I want to get on that tip eventually because our Instagram, we're basically curating a museum of scene stuff and things we put together. If Instagram goes away tomorrow, it's all gone. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly yeah. right. I mean, I was, I remember when MySpace was a big deal and it was wonderful. And I, you know, would send out a MySpace bulletin and it would do more than my email list ever would. Mm -hmm. But then MySpace went away and then I had nothing. And then Facebook came up and they've been, you know, terrible to artists over the time. I don't know if you remember, but early Facebook, there was like eight different ways you could try and be an artist page on Facebook, but it kept changing. And so every time it changed, you'd have to fucking rebuild it and redo it. And, uh, and then, yeah. And now you've got the gram and Twitter and everything. And, 
Exactly. We are beholden to the popularity of these platforms Mm -hmm. and that sucks. And so I just refuse to have a creative output that's based in that. And I would, I, I could not urge you more to go. In fact, I'll plug a, I'll plug a place called band Zoogle. Um, mm-hmm. They're a really cool website platform and they're the f- first platform that I think has made a kind of a one-stop shopping thing where you could really create a nice audio visual world. You can have subscriptions, you can do, you know, e-commerce, all the shit. It's all in one place and it's real easy because I'm not like a big like web coding guy. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, so Banzoogle, I'm going to go and plug them because they rule. Um, and I really urge anyone listening, build your own website. I know it seems archaic and ridiculous, but it's sort of like headlining your own shows like we were talking about. Yeah. Like Facebook and Instagram, it's like you're always the opening act. You're never the headliner. And unless you're fucking massive, but uh, how many of us ever get gazillions of followers? It's sort of like having a big hit. It doesn't generally happen. And so the rest of us are just kind of food for the machine, but we aren't reaping any of the benefits of it, really. Um, right. So anyway, that's my that's my that's my spiel for everyone to get the fuck off the networks and go back to the internet <laughs> the way it was. I'm with you. I want to get there because much to my detriment, my attitude is just, you know, I don't want to be controlled by anyone. I don't want to be held down. I don't want to owe anyone anything. So I want to build my own thing. Do it. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> it's going to happen. I'm glad we actually talked about my website a little bit because that in and of itself is a big art project that's ongoing. I've got a, I've got a really wonderful community there whereby you can hear eight gazillion songs of mine, all of the stuff that you can find on the streaming networks, but then a ton of stuff you can't. Um, and I'm putting up new demos all the time. So that's kind of a big deal. My home, my website home is a big deal. And I would love to see people there. And then the new record. Um, I'm so fucking proud of it. It's my first, it's my first full length album in about five years. I've done lots of projects all the time, but I'm some, and it's my first solo record in a long fucking time. And I'm just so proud of it. So that's my main thing that I'll plug. It's going to be, uh, pre-orders will go up pretty soon um, and it'll be released later this year, early next. We're just trying to finish it and get it right and do all the things we can with it. So that's the main stuff, but I don't know. Mostly it's just been really fun talking with you and um, anyone who wants to find out more, yeah, just come to the site and say hi and I answer everything personally still and um, that's the way I like to do it. That's great. And it's jonahmatranga.com, right? That's it. That's all it. Right. So, folks, check out the website, jonamatranga.com. We're going to check out the new record. It's going to be out by the time you're listening to this. So you could listen together, listen to some of the podcasts, bounce to the record, listen back. That's what I do when I'm editing. It's a lot of fun. And we're going to check out the book. Once again, uh, what was it called? Alone Rewinding, which, by the way, for the nerds out there, Alone Rewinding, just like New End Original, is an anagram for one-line drawing. Wow. Whoa. Yeah, brah. <laughs> English major strikes again. Well, Jonah, you've created so much music over the years that we just absolutely love. And I just want to say thanks so much for talking to us tonight. Totally. Thank you so much. This was a blast. Really fun, wide range of conversation. Oh, and one more thing I'll plug, I guess, just for fun of it. And because we've been talking about post hardcore and stuff and making music with amazing people, I did a thing called Kimora a couple of years ago with. Uh, Jay Robbins and Zach Barocas from Jawbox. Ooh. And yeah, it's a, it's a really fucking cool EP. Go check it out. The, um, the band is called Camorra, C A M O R R A. Uh, and the record is called morning resistance celebration. And I'm really, really proud of it. And not that many people have heard of it because we just really didn't do much with it, but I love the music very much. So that is my last plug for the day. I didn't even know that existed. I can't wait to check that out. So, oh, you are and gonna love it. So, Jonah, thanks so much for being on, and we'll talk to you later on. Thanks, you guys. There you have it, folks. Jonah Matranga. That was a uh, that was an awesome conversation. That was like, and that's exactly what we aim for is like just to have a conversation. Like that was really that flowed really well. I really like that. 
Yeah, we covered a lot of different topics. I got to talk about New End Original and FAR and the impact. And You know, there was a story I wanted to share. We didn't get time. I have this fond memory of, I was at one of the Hellfests. I think it was when I was on tour with This Day Forward, maybe Hellfest 2003. Thursday, the band was playing. And I remember walking around in the evening time, kind of far away from the stage. And Thursday was covering Mother Mary the far song oh yeah from water and solutions and i just remember walking around and like hearing it in the distance and i was like oh that's cool (laughs) it's so weird to think about some of this music and those times like i can listen to a record and be right back in that time and have that feeling and it, it just feels like a lifetime ago yeah no it really does because i can think of like when i hear certain songs especially now that like uh we bring the uh little like uh bluetooth speaker with us to when Mm -hmm. we go to the skate park so ellie and i went on saturday and sunday morning and man it's so fun to just put my like just random songs on and then because we're there so early there's nobody there literally there's nobody even walking their dogs in the park or anything like that so it's like Mm -hmm. you have the whole place to yourself so just listening to music and it was so nice to be like look, this is music I listened to when I was growing up. And then what was the song that came on that immediately? And of course, in typical me fashion, I had a complete story about it to the point where Eleanor (laughs) just looked at me and was like, can we skateboard? And I was like, yes, (laughs) skateboard. Like, God damn it. Uh, So your kids do that too. I had this whole song story to Eleanor about how the first time I heard that song. And I remember I was where I was sitting in the car I remember who was driving. Like it was just all this whole thing. And she just like, was like so checked out. She's like, we're here at six 30 in the morning. Can we please do what we come to- came here to do? You're going to have a story for every goddamn song in this playlist. You idiot. Like My dream is, t- is to come to your house, do an in-person episode and have your children on so I can get their impression of you and just see what they think about your stories and everything. Oh, uh, they're, they're not going to be happy. Like they're going to, they're going to, it's one of those things that, uh, I do it so often, especially with things in the house. Like when they, they ask a question, Mm -hmm. I go all in and like go into as much detail as I possibly can. And sometimes they're so up for it and they get interested about it and they want to watch a YouTube video about it. And then other times after about 10 seconds, you can watch their eyes just glaze over. (laughs) And I'm like, you know what? I'm finishing. I don't give a shit if you're not listening or not. (laughs) I'm finishing this story. I don't say much and I keep it really short to create intrigue. Or people just think I'm weird and I don't want to talk to them. Yeah, there's something to be said to really be careful with the words you say. Because if you just speak so freely, you stop trying to kind of like, actually kind of like, you know, like what Jonah was saying, like when he would go do like the interviews, like Mm -hmm. you kind of start to chunk parts together. So you know how it can kind of flow. And it's like, when you think like that, it definitely, you take a lot more time to think through what you have to say and what you have to say usually means a lot more. Yeah. It's gotta be natural. It's gotta be natural. And with print, that's why I'm glad podcasts exist because, and the internet and YouTube, because print is fucked up. People fuck it up. I've done one printed band interview ever in my first band. And that I was completely misquoted. I remember being horrified because they were asking us what we do before the show, before we play. And I said, I like, I have a Guinness or something. And they misquoted me with the singer. So they misquoted me as saying, I have a glass of wine. Oh, and no. I was like, oh, I don't oh. want to be glass of wine guy. Oh, you're a glass of wine guy? Did I'm, you have... I'm like the crazy guy. Oh, no. Did you have a clove cigarette, too? <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, but whatever. That was a long time ago. But I recently listened to, oh, it was the anniversary of Hope's Fall, the satellite years recently. And Ryan Parrish, who recorded that record with them, he's in the band again. Um, he was answering questions in his Instagram story about the album. So I went to meet up with some friends. I'm like, let me throw this on. And I love that record, especially at this time, because I remember this time, 18 years ago, coming home from that first tour, I was 20 years old. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was a strange time. And I can listen to that record and feel exactly how I felt at that time. That's good, though. That's like a really nice thing. Of that's music is uh, what's it's the time travel transcendental. 
Yes. It takes you to another time and place. Yes. And and it was just good to talk to Jonah. He's made a lot of music that I love. I mean, come on. Water and Solutions? That's fucking my Led Zeppelin uh, 4. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it was when he was like, I love Led Zeppelin. I'm like, Keith doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin is one of the few classic rock bands that I genuinely like. See, I, I don't. There's so many classic rock bands that are fucking awesome that I'm like, it, oh. yeah, dude. No, it's boring. Listen, I. That's why I like talking to these. These guys are my heroes. This is what I listen to. These are the musicians I look up to. I actually don't want to talk to Led Zeppelin. No, I'm just kidding. If anyone from Led Zeppelin wants yeah. to come on the show, we'll we're more than happy to have you. I'm trying to talk to Blue Oyster Cult. Yeah, that's like one of those. Uh, that's a song that. Don't fear the reaper. I remember the the not. I don't remember the exact first time I heard it, but I remember the first time when I heard it, and I was like, "How do they make the guitar sound like that?" That that breakdown in the middle with the the epic guitar oh, solo. That's yeah, very yeah. Radiohead have to be inspired by that. Yeah. Like when I oh, hear yeah, that, those, all I hear all I hear is Radiohead. Those wide open breaks, and it's just like, yeah, those are yeah. great though. I, I that's a that's such a. <laughs> that's such a dark song when you really like listen to the lyrics it's yeah. just like holy shit i i was listening to it in the car the one day and i it, he does say one of the lines is like another forty thousand a day or something like that and i'm like oh he's talking about people dying yeah <laughs> that's fucking nuts it's a great song before i knew who they were they played them in the beginning of the stand tv mini miniseries many years ago oh yeah i remember that yeah, and I was like, "That's a good song." And "Burning for You," come on, that's a banger too. That's the good. That's the guitar parts where I first heard like harmonizing, and I was like, "Wow, that's a weird sound, but it's cool." Like, yeah, yeah, that's good shit. It is certainly good shit. It's funny though that he brought up Boston. I, I lo- like when I was growing up. I always remember seeing that record at my house. The Boston, With the Dolphin. No, the uh which one am i thinking of the one that has like almost like a kind of ufo on the front oh yeah yeah that one. i remember seeing all those album covers in jukeboxes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but it, it was just such a good like there was just a bunch of hits on it like <laughs> it was literally just like there's like 18 songs on there and like seven of them were in the i'm just making up numbers now never mind <laughs> well think about it it's a good thing we got into this music if we were into like if we were into boring shit like the beatles and i don't know the beatles we're <laughs> we're not going to get them on the podcast no we'd have to talk to some guy who like met them once and that wouldn't be cool we're we're, we're going direct to the source man we're yeah. talking to the people who made this shit it's certainly uh an interesting kind of thing that we've kind of carved out here it's it's definitely uh we've kind of gone like pretty eclectic sometimes and like kind of deviated away from it and i think you've addressed it before like that like this isn't just about the northeast but man was it nice talking to somebody about the northeast (laughs) yeah yeah we we always come back to the northeast i have a grand vision for this show i'm thinking artists interesting people Maybe from the Northeast, maybe not, you know, it, and music can be a tie-in. It's primarily going to be musicians. Who knows? The possibilities are endless. We're nope. only on episode 34. Can you believe that? I, I can't. No authors, though. I'm not reading a book. I'm not doing homework for this thing. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I don't fucking, I don't want to no. get, like, <laughs> I, I do literally you... don't have time for that. How long is the book? 327 pages. Fuck yeah. that. I'm not doing I, that. <laughs> if it's a really big author, I'll have them on, but I'm not reading the book. I'll like they're, the sp- they're just, they're just going to have to talk about it. I'll get the spark notes. Yeah. I won't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, th- we have a consistent fan base. It's awesome. It's more people than I imagined would listen, which is a nice surprise. And we've been heard in like over 30 countries now. Do you know this? Oh shit, really? No, Hold on a sec. Check this out. Okay, we've been heard in the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Germany, Italy, Malaysia, Belgium, Greece, Norway, India, Sweden, Singapore, Chile, New Zealand, Mexico, Brazil, Ireland. It goes on and on. I hope the dude in Norway was Varg from fucking uh, 
Burzum. Oh yeah, that too. <laughs> no, he's like a crazy person now. Like he's yeah. like he's like a, a legitimate. I, I hope he doesn't. He's one of those. Oh, he <laughs> Varg Vikings or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vil- Vilkins, I think. But yeah, yeah, I watched some crazy like short about him before. He, I think he's like a white nationalist now, though. So oh, uh, he, he is not legit. We do not support him. Yeah, I was gonna say we. He's yeah, he's not yeah. cool anymore. I don't no. think. No, I. Like if you I'm, could cancel black metal, he's canceled the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, he's out. Tommy, for, as a favor to me, don't bring up white nationalists <laughs> unless it's to talk badly about them. I don't have time to research while I'm talking. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad I thought of that though, because I was like, wait, how do I like as I'm like forming the sentences? I'm like, wait, how do I know like this? that dude and then i'm like wait i saw a thing about him and he was saying like all types of crazy shit that's why i'm thinking of him like oh not a not a good thing not a good horse to back that's not a scene i want to even mention no. like, you that brings up a good point you ever see people like they'll post something they're against and be like this is bad yeah like why why would you do that like I, i'm scrolling through instagram and i see you post a picture of trump and you're like i don't like him I just think you're a Trump supporter. See, I you're posting it. I I feel like, (sighs) or if you get like a if you get like a swastika tattooed on you and then put an X through it, you have a swastika tattooed on you. That's a stupid way to do things. (laughs) If you're against something, don't pay money to have it tattooed on you. That's dumb. Yeah, it's it's honestly it's it's very strange. uh, I think. The way the political climate is, and also that combined with us being homebound for the most part, um, or at least the majority of us are, it's kind of given us this weird cabin fever that we've taken out on the internet and through social media. And I saw somebody post something uh, like in a local Facebook group about uh, one of their political signs got stolen from the front of their house. And... I didn't even read the post, but I mean, I read the post, but I, I mean, the comments, there were already 147 comments. And I was like, this is like a local yokel, like Feasterville group, bro. Like this isn't fucking. It's, it's so meaningless. Like someone took, <sighs> someone took your sign out of your yard. What and is, 147 what? people took time out of their day to fucking say something. It means nothing. You're still going to go to the polls and vote for your guy. Like, yeah what, no who, yeah who cares and I, I think uh there's a lot of it it's is rooted i think for me at least there's like kind of like a there's a nihilism that goes along it with with me it's like it doesn't matter it meet the new boss same as the old boss like it's all the same like i feel like all <laughs> the same shit like you get the same fucking outcome anyway so it's like fuck it it like, is you you get republican or republican light yeah, take your pick and i you know it was really funny somebody brought something up and i was like it was one of these like back and forth facebook posts and they were like the meme had something to do about trump putting kids in cages and some the first comment and it was actually a kid i went to high school with i was really smart was like actually the kids in cages thing started under the obama administration and i was like that's bullshit it did <laughs> ICE detention center started under Obama. I'm like, holy shit, really? Like, I thought that was all Trump, dude. That's fucking insane to me that I've never heard this before. That's why the two-party political system, that's why this whole thing is in place to keep us distracted away from the bigger picture. So everyone's hyper-focused on Trump. Now, don't get me wrong. Trump is horrible. Trump is bad. I don't want him. We don't need him. We're stupid for electing him or whoever elected them. But the much bigger problem is how things are set up in this country. You know, we, we can't we can't take a billion out of our defense budget and have universal health care. We can't take a billion out of our defense budget and make sure everyone has everyone has somewhere to live. How can we afford it? How can we afford that defense budget? I I still think it's it's wild to me, and I thought this the other day because we were going through old pictures, and I saw something that kind of jarred my memory. But we lived in the apartments in Ben Salem, and you know Kelly grew up. My wife grew up in the mountains, and the f- third week we were moved in the apartments in Ben Salem right after we had gotten married. 
there was a SWAT team that was called in because there was a guy holding his family hostage across the street in the single family homes. So they sent the sniper. Keep in mind, he comes out with like a full ghillie suit, you know, like the big like thing they wear in the movies, like the shaggy, like green thing. That's like camo yeah. and, and a tank, a tank came into the courtyard. I was like, okay, so why does the local police have a tank? <laughs> <laughs> this seems a bit unnecessary. Like yeah. it was like a legitimate, like for like, you know, it didn't have the tracks on the bottom, of it, but it was like, a t- it was built like a fucking tank. I was like, this is, what do you need this for? It's a guy with a shotgun. <laughs> we, we defund education every year in this oh. country. Why can't we defund some of the police? I, because freedom is an illusion. Now I'm done with my rants and we're out of time. There we go. Yes. Uh, well, listen, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Jonah, for coming on. That was fantastic. Everybody, keep listening. Keep subscribing. Keep liking. Keep following. Write us, northeastscene at gmail.com. Search out our YouTube page. Follow that shit. Search out our Instagram and Twitter pages. Follow that shit. Uh, get in touch. We want to hear from you. So, Tommy, any really quick final closing words? No, uh, be nice. If you have teachers in your life, be nice to them right now. There you go. (laughs) It's rough. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. They deserve it. They're teaching you shit. All right. That's it. Thanks everybody for listening. And until next time.